TLO, what's poppin'? We are on kickkickcake.com. We are uh, we are live. We live. But by the time you see this, we probably won't be. Maybe we will be, man. But just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right above me, if we go live and you happen to miss it, this is where you can catch any highlights and things of that nature. Uh, right behind me, don't forget, we do got merch. Got mine on. Yeah, get me. And don't forget, we do got the Patreon. We post five days a week. We just posted to this seconds ago. The link to all of this is down in the description below. Just click more and there, uh, hit that link tree and it'll open right on up, man. This is the, how far are we in this video yet? Wait, we got to wait for a minute to pass before I get to saying what. This is, this pedophile murders kids on the dark web. This by Ape Hunter. This came out a few months ago. I had seen it, but I was like, man. I ain't trying to be watching all this today, man. You know, it gets spooky. We might watch Top Gear today, low key. It's a very high chance because it's early right now. So we might could fit that in here. No lie. We got to figure out which one we're going to watch, though. All right, let's get into this, man. Oh, wait. It's Monday. It's... What else? We might watch that and we might watch something else. What's it called? Lad's Army. Maybe watch Mad Lad's Army. Is that what it's called? We'll figure it out when the time comes. Let's get into it. More than 20 minors who were being abused by users of the site have been rescued. Officials say... They seize more than 250,000 videos. That's staggering, with disturbing references to abuse of very young children and even toddlers. At a press conference, officials said it was one of the first times seeing cryptocurrency in trafficking child pornography. Imagine. This is on a dark web, too. Something that's already used for a lot of illegal stuff, but then y'all doing this on there? Like, is it that? Like, it's like y'all. Because it's wigging. Guys, it's time to. Immediate is crazy. Salute, though, eight. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Jesse Liu. I'm the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia. Thank you all for being here for this very important announcement of significant actions to protect children from sexual exploitation. I'm joined today by key partners in the federal government's fight against those who exploit the most vulnerable among us. That's the Department of Justice announcing that they've just managed to shut down the dark web's largest child pornography site in October of 2019. That fact still rings true as I'm recording this video in 2023. 337 pedophiles who produced, uploaded, and downloaded content from said site were arrested and some jailed. As the result of an operation carried out by the UK's National Crime Agency, the IRS, the Homeland Security, the Korean National Police, and the German Federal Criminal Police. Although 337 arrests were made, there were roughly 1.3 million users at the height of the website's popularity, with 360,000 videos being downloaded. And believe it or not, in the words of the investigators themselves, if it wasn't for the blockchain, we wouldn't have even seen those 337 arrests. Could the investigation have gone a different way if not for the blockchain? Oh, they said 1.2 million people was partaking in this? Close to 350k down. Yo, the world is a spooky place, man. Maybe. But the tactics used in the months long investigation. There's 7 billion. Who knows how many adults there are in this world, but y'all like y'all got y'all got the nerve. He should have relied heavily on it. And so without the blockchain, there would have been no case. In spite of the fact that the Department of Justice eventually took down the largest child pornography site on the dark web in 2019, the origins of this case can be traced all the way back to 2008. It's a long one. Pause. 
Operation Darknet. July 24th, 2008. Freedom Hosting, a specialist web hosting service, emerges on the Tor browser. It offers a plethora of hidden services to only those who can navigate their way around the darkest side of the internet. Back in 2008, there wasn't many who could. Some notable services. So you had to put in real effort. Like you had to really, really be a try hard, is what they're saying. Services, Tormail, which allowed users to send and receive email anonymously to email addresses inside and outside the Tor network. HackBB, a hidden internet forum specializing in buying stolen credit cards, skimming ATMs, and hacking computers, servers, and accounts. And then there was the hidden wiki. This held a directory of links to other hidden websites within the Tor browser. Freedom Hosting would eventually be home to half of all Tor sites that were available at that time. It began to attract many visitors for both the right and wrong reasons. For example, those who wanted to communicate in secret could do so, but a wide range of criminals had a field day and the authorities couldn't do anything about it because, to put it simply, for a while, they had no way of knowing anyone's true identity. Although for years, the web hosting service remained in the shadows of the dark web, away from the majority of the general public, that would all change in October of 2011. I didn't even know the dark web had been around for this long. That's crazy. <laughs> Not gonna lie, this is W editing. If this was edited with the sidebar and everything. It might be real. Dear citizens of the internet, over the past decade, the internet has become an increasingly integral part of our daily lives. It has evolved into the catalyst behind free media, free speech, and global communication. Since its inception, the World Wide Web has become a prominent medium for individuals such as journalists and activists alike. However, a great injustice lurks beneath the surface. A vile infestation of abhorrent animals have been growing, parasitically spreading like cancer. Unknown to the world, it has consumed and victimized innocent children as well as adults. The growing trade of child pornography has become a major problem. While government organizations have put much effort into the dismantling of individuals and websites dedicated to this repulsive trade, the providers of this content have grown frustrated and moved their trades into a much seedier place known as the Darknet, a network dedicated only to the iniquities that are outcasted by the society who strive in. Unfortunately, a potentially benevolent resource has been corrupted by these... Is this a real video or is this part of... Like Abe Honcho's video? that he created this part. ...and sadistic abominations of the world. We, Anonymous, have an eternal duty to fight against the social injustices of this world. When we came into this virtual realm, we were disgusted with the content that was provisioned and readily available for the perverted masses. Many of us have lingering traumatic images of the material that these pedophiles were hiding on the darknet. Anonymous took a pledge to defend the defenseless and fight for the fallen. We rallied an army called the Legion, and armed ourselves with our Chris Hansen cannons. We set out for the great hunt which has become Operation Darknet, also known as- Chris Hansen cannons are crazy. Give me one. That's tough. To catch a predator. We found that a majority of the Darknet pedophiles were using a site called Lilita City. We demanded that the major provider of the host known as Freedom Hosting rid their servers of such reprehensible materials. Unfortunately, to our horror, the owner of Freedom Hosting was the perpetrator for most of the pedophilic content. We are now aware that this provider has over 100 gigabytes of content depicting children being sexually exploited for money and sick thrills that only the underlying insects of this world could take pleasure in. While successful like you know it's messed up but then when you get to hearing the numbers behind how much was how much like what did you just say 100 gigabytes like to identify users and take down the hosting provider of this unacceptable content the darknet is a vast sea with many providers and they are all 
However, we fully intend to make it uninhabitable for these disgusting degenerates to exist without the fear of prosecution or death. This is our message, our manifesto. You may hold us to every last word, for we will never turn a deaf ear upon the screams of innocent children. You know who you are, and so do we. We are anonymous. Salute. Mess. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. On the 14th of October 2011, a member of the anonymous hacking group had been browsing the hidden wiki when they noticed a section titled Hard Candy, a directory of child pornography links. Disgusted by what they had just witnessed, the hacker quickly worked their magic and removed all links from Hard Candy. Job complete. Well, not exactly. You see, five minutes later, an admin on Hidden Wiki edited all of the links back in, and it was business as usual. Upon further investigation, the hacker noticed that 95% of the links listed on the Hidden Wiki shared a digital fingerprint with Freedom Hosting. And when the hacker redirected their efforts, they came to the conclusion that Freedom Hosting had been the home to the largest collection of child pornography on the internet, including The Love Zone, a site where Richard Huckle dubbed Britain's worst pedophile was an avid user run. The hacker would reach out Richard Huckle. Never heard of him. I'll write it down. Richard Huckle. With a last name like Huckle, I'm not surprised. Not even gonna lie to you. But to Freedom Hosting's unidentified owner to issue a warning to remove the content from their servers, but they refused. And so four hours later, a bunch of anonymous hackers assembled from forum boards such as 4chan, and they began to DDoS attack Freedom Hosting, rendering the service unusable. However, within 24 hours of the attack, Freedom Hosting's owner was able to restore services via a backup. In response, Anonymous issued several more warnings, but the owner refused once again. So a further DDoS attack took place, even after new security measures had been implemented. Was this it then? Were Anonymous about to shut down the largest host of child pornography on the dark net? Well, yes and no. The fact that they're putting up such a fight to- oh. <laughs> You see, Anonymous- put Not Anonymous, but the, the owner of Freedom Host is like, a final statement stating that they managed to grab a total of 190 unique IPs of people trying to gain access to Hard Candy and Lolita City, but ultimately the sites would continue to run moving forward. It's also unclear if any arrests were made as the result of the operation. But it would be something that happened nine days earlier that really caught the media's attention in regards to this operation and therefore the general public were made aware of it at the height of the ddos attacks which prevented over 40 different I'm not gonna lie i ain't never heard of none of this not this operation not none of not not a word of it child pornography websites from being accessed the one that stood out from the rest was lolita city home to 100 gigabytes of child pornography images the ages of the children ranged anywhere from newborn all the way through to 17. oh what in god's name did they just say newborn year old teens the content was being viewed thousands of times a day. On the 18th of October 2011, Anonymous managed to hack into Lolita City, meaning they had access to all 1,500 users of the site. Although their usernames were the only information to be leaked to the public, Anonymous stated that they had identified many of the users and had asked law enforcement to reach out for details. However, once again, it's unclear if any arrests were made as the result of this. Some would label Anonymous's operation a success. Others had called it a global advertisement for child pornography. Yes. I'm almost positive if Anonymous can get their real, you know what I'm saying, their real information, then I'm pretty sure they're unrelenting. They, would, they could go around and figure out where they worked and send what they've been doing to their bosses and make their life very impossible. See, by July of 2013, hit them with the EDP just under two years on even though you could only gain access by invite freedom hosting hard candy lolita city and others had all grown tenfold another 160 child exploitation websites would emerge over that same period but just as the sickening online communities were growing they'd be shut down temporarily all thanks to the fbi i say temporarily because sadly ladies and gentlemen although it was the end of the road for freedom hosting the majority of the sites hosted would continue just elsewhere on the dark net. 
They would have to have somebody doing this 24-7. Working and shutting down the dark web 24-7. Dublin, Ireland. Okay. March 2019. I wish I would have had this. The Supreme Court has cleared the way for the extradition of a man accused. You know what's crazy? I, I seen this when it came out, like the day it came out. Like I didn't watch it, but I see it came across my timeline. But I seen the thumbnail and I was like, did I do? Like I had just recently watched one of these, something like this. And it was, it, it, it kind of looked like the same person on the thumbnail. So that's why I didn't do it until just now. Accused until of being now. the world's biggest facilitator of child abuse images. 33-year-old Eric Owen Marquez, who has an address at Mountjoy Square in Dublin 1, is wanted by the U.S. authorities for conspiring to distribute and to advertise child abuse images. There was no stay on today's rulings, which means that he can be extradited immediately. The country's highest court has now upheld the previous judgments of the High Court and the Court of Appeal, and Eric Owen Marquez has now exhausted all legal avenues. He has no time left. There was no stay put on today's Supreme Court ruling and he can be extradited to the US to face child abuse charges immediately. Ten years on from Eric's arrest and the details about how the FBI managed to track him down. Look at him. The pedo walk. That's crazy. Still remain a mystery. The only reference we have, Eric's US indictment, states that an investigation in 2013 found Eric's US indictment. That he built. You know what? Let me just... States that an investigation in 2013 found a key IP address linked to Freedom Hosting. After Eric's arrest, the FBI took over Freedom Hosting and kept things running briefly before shutting down the whole operation. Within that short period of time, they secretly deployed a JavaScript file to the majority of the sites hosted on Freedom Hosting. In simple terms, the script exploited Virus. a bug within the Tor browser, which bypassed the IP anonymization feature, therefore collecting real-world IP addresses of users accessing child exploitation websites. Good. This information was then sent to an FBI-controlled server, and officials used the data to launch other investigations to track down other suspected pedophiles. Although Eric stated, we do not give permission for any upload of any illegal files. If you choose to do so anyway, we are not responsible for your actions. I will not assist in any use of this server for illegal purposes. Sorry, I have to protect myself. And I do not consent to the use of the freedom hosting server for That's any illegal Eric activities. Put. If you do illegal activities on this server, I will not go to jail for you. If my identity is compromised and I'm questioned slash forced to cooperate to identify you, I will do it to ensure my freedom. The FBI still held him accountable, as did Anonymous, two years before for hosting child exploitation websites. The latter going a step further, claiming that Eric himself had either A, been the owner of Lolita City, or B, had in some way been deeply connected with the site. Yeah, nah, for, for, for sure. For sure. It's happening on your platform or whatever, how you're hosting it, you involved. 100%. You're giving people an avenue to do this. Eric's response to the FBI was that he was simply an innocent party who hosted a range of different websites on the dark net. The evidence doesn't suggest that Eric had owned Lolita City, but he most definitely wasn't the innocent party he claimed to be. When Garda officers raided his apartment in Dublin Island, he made a dash for his computer in the hopes of turning it off, even though his PC at that point had been password locked. For those of you who aren't aware, when you turn your PC off, it erases the information stored on the RAM. And Eric was fully aware of this. So he attempted to shut down his PC, but officers stopped him from doing so. When the PC was forensically examined, the data from the RAM was pulled. And although they'd never crack into the PC itself, they had more than enough evidence to link him to Freedom Hosting. It wasn't just that though. You see, the data showed that Eric had been accessing a child pornography site that he hosted on Freedom Hosting 1,534 times. The site, reports say, had categories such as jailbait, preteen, toddlers, girls and boys. Each category contained numerous vi- Like I, like, it's something mentally 
wrong, but at the same time, you, life in jail to fix it. Videos of child sexual abuse. Another website he viewed, which was once again hosted on Freedom Hosting, had been visited 412 times, according to the data on the RAM. From images pulled from said site, 107 of them matched files on Eric's RAM. One of those was of an infant girl being abused. Eric was eventually charged with conspiracy to advertise and distribute child pornography on the dark net by prosecutors over in Maryland in the United States of America. They called him the kingpin of child porn after the FBI estimated that 8.4 million images and videos had surfaced via freedom hosting. It wasn't going to be an easy job securing a final sentence though, because as you know, he resided in Ireland. It took six years for his extradition to finally be granted. And on February 6th, 2020, he finally pleaded guilty to the charges that were placed against him. Eric Marquis was sentenced. He played out too. He ain't even fight. So he probably got a lesser sentence. To 27 years in prison. Talk about it. 27 still not even enough, but that's a lot. Followed by lifetime supervision upon release. They're going to get 27 years of man Well, the district court today them. imposed a sentence of 27 years followed by lifetime supervised release, which is a, an important message to send to not only to Eric Marquez, who, as you know, was the largest facilitator of child pornography in the world, but also in terms of general. Am I, like that, that, having that title attached to your name is just like... Like, what do you do at that point? Even when 27 years pass, you're going to have to change your name still. Deterrence. That sentence sends a powerful message to those who are trading in child pornography or are contemplating uh, trading in child pornography. Mr. Marquez essentially created a market for others to trade and promote child pornography. And he was creating the demand he did. and the supply for a very dangerous and harmful trade to children throughout the world. And it was important to get a sentence that not only tells those out there that we will find you and hold you accountable for trading and child pornography, but also to the victims to make sure they know that law enforcement here and overseas are committed to uh, finding the criminals who exploit them and then when we can seeking restitution for them. That's a disgusting man. It was one point something million users on all of them. Some wild, they wild. There's adult women out here. Like I, <laughs> it's the craziest name. I, okay. Open your folders and show the camera. This was not the right commercial to put after that. Let's hurry up. Let's wait. Skip. There were many who watched Anonymous temporarily take down Freedom Hosting and Lalita City in real time on 4chan. One of those who would later go by the moniker Looks wanted to help Anonymous in their fight against pedophilia, but had found himself on the side of those who he originally set out to attack. The great irony was that he was led there by the very people who were trying to expose it as evil. I discovered numerous forums that existed on the dark web. Before long, I was hooked. In Lux's early days with online pedophiles, he created a persona of an American pediatrician, claiming to have had numerous sexual encounters with children, as well as maintaining an ongoing sexual relationship with a specific six-year-old child. The content he had consumed in his early days was far too tame though, if you can even imagine that. And so he struck up a plan to create his own website where more hardcore content could be posted with less moderation. By early 2013, Lux had created not just one dog net site rather a few his name had rang bells in online pedophile groups 
He was said to have been the go-to guy for anything pedophile related. It had even reached the point to where he was giving out advice to users on his sites. Some of the advice included topics such as how to groom and sexually abuse young children, how to ensure there were no signs of sexual penetration, how to drug children so they would be awake during the abuse but would have no memory of it afterwards, and how to kid- I'm not even gonna lie, watching this is giving me anxiety and I don't even get anxiety. Like I can't, like this is, I'm, this has still got an hour left. Snap, kill and dispose of a child's body. He was everything nightmares were made of. The decision would be made to house all of the websites under one banner with a few new additions as Lux's websites started to grow in popularity. Pedo Empire, a one-stop shop for all things pedophilia, hosted by yours truly, Freedom Hosting. Most nights when I got home from work, instead of sitting back and watching TV, I bust out my laptop and got working on Pedo Empire, hopefully creating something which makes the community at least a smidgen better. One of the most popular sites that was a part of his empire was Pedo Wiki. At the height of its popularity, it had over 3 million page views and contained over 1,200 different articles. Some of the sites on the empire required an invite from a trusted member to gain access. As a member, you would be allowed basic viewing privileges, but you'd have to prove yourself to gain access to more premium areas. For example, you'd have to share images or films that hadn't been previously uploaded to the dark net. And trust me, Lux had his way of vetting such content. On other sites, if members wanted to stay active in a producer's lounge, they would have to show they were actively abusing children on a weekly basis or else they'd be kicked. The never before seen footage would have to include children holding a sign with a unique identifier, such as the name of the site or a phrase created by love. This is disgusting. I promise this is the weirdest, this is some of the wildest stuff I ever heard. So what he did was give people weirdos give people rewards for going out and doing this type of stuff In February of 2013, some users of the Empire voiced their opinion that they wanted something more extreme. They wanted more depravity, more violence, and looks well, he delivered. Hurt to the core, a site dedicated to hurt core pornography. Hurt to the Core was the first of its kind on the dark net, a forum dedicated to videos, images, and discussion about the rape, torture, and even murder of young children. At the height of its popularity, it garnered 400,000 views per day. Although Lux claimed he didn't necessarily like the content that was- 400,000 a day? posted on Hurt to the Core. He believed that others did, and so he hosted it in the name of Freedom of Speech. Hurt to the Core was split into different sections. One of those sections had been split into different threads discussing different topics. By July of 2013, 23,000 posts were made talking about 2,192 different topics, which included how-to guides. Some of the most popular guides were as follows. Kiddie porn for dummies, created by Lux. Toddler child porn star. How you like to make them scream. Sex tourism and prostitution. Where to find them sexy little kids. And advice and guides on how to get what you want from kiddies. Some of the most popular general topic threads were as follows. Three men and a baby. Butchered bitches. Youngins bound. Crying rape. Need ideas for blackmailed girl aged 15 and bestiality. Out of all of the empire, Lux was most active on Hurt to the Core. And he wasn't just making guides for members to use. No, no, no. He was giving out advice to some members about Hurt Core related topics. Which does make you question if he actually was into the content that was being produced. Right, didn't he just say he wasn't into it? I mean, if you're hosting it, you're into it. I don't give a fuck. Used on site. One member wanted advice about filming the abduction, rape, and murder of a five-year-old girl in Russia. Okay, good. So, do you have a plan? And this is not just a fantasy for you. I have many contacts willing to purchase such a video. It was never confirmed if the Russian had gone through with the plan. 
An American user wanted advice about producing and distributing the abuse of a seven-year-old girl who suffered with muscular dystrophy and was a mute. I work in the medical field and if you show me a picture of her wheelchair, I bet I could track you down in a week. It's too dangerous to distribute as she's too recognizable. However, you should make it for your own gratification. At least you know she can't cry for help. The user would then ask Lux about releasing just the audio. If you record audio, then that can give a lot away, but it's good, the fact she can't speak. I don't think it's going to narrow it down. As word began to spread about her to the core, many law enforcement agencies and hacking groups had tried to gain access to the site. But as you could only gain access by referral, I ain't even got nothing to say, man. I'm just gonna watch. Barrel. No one was able to enter. However, hackers had indeed managed to enter Hurt to the Core in December of 2013, according to reports coming out of Mexico. One topic that was pointed out was something the hackers discovered in a thread titled Child Sex and Prostitution. To sum up, a user from Mexico stated that children as young as infants could be delivered by human traffickers to any hotel or home in any city or state for the rental price of 4,000 US dollars. And if they wanted to buy them, it would set them back 10,000 US dollars. Speaking of his own experience, he stated he paid more than 30,000 USD to buy three children two boys aged two and six years old you know what's crazy like remember i don't know if y'all seen but in the news they have found them hotels with tunnels and with tunnels underneath and a four-year-old girl to sexually abuse them at a ranch he owned in mexico adding he had to pay extra because all three died as a result of the sexual abuse he put them through with the information now in hand, the hackers would reach out to the Mexican National Security Council and the Mexican Federal Police to tell them that children were potentially being trafficked around various parts of Mexico and that they should check in with various orphanages to see if children were indeed going missing after being adopted. On December 9th, 2013, Governor Fausto Falejo Figuerejo announced that he, along with law enforcement agencies from across Mexico, had launched an investigation to dismantle an organized pedophile network that had been operating out of Morelia, a city in the state of Michoacan. This network was said to have been posting and exchanging photos of under- I'm just, man, listen, where is the cartel when you need them? I ain't even gonna hold you. I can't even hold my breath like this in Mexico. Where's the cartel? The cartel should be ex like they should be doing what they need to be doing out there to take care of this whatever this issue is. Raged children on hurt to the core. The group had been exposed thanks to the work of the hackers. What's never been confirmed though is whether this group had in fact been abducting children and selling them on. As of September 2015, Mexican news outlets reported that no arrests came as the result of the operation. Are you none? interested in wholesaling or flipping abandoned? I say no, no. How none? In early 2013, rumors began circulating on the dark net about a video titled Daisy's Destruction. Depending on who was telling the story, it would vary in regards to the content. But one common theme was that it involved the torture of at least one young girl. Many claimed it would go a step further and contained the murder of said girl. With reports that some allegedly paid $10,000 to receive a copy, it looked as if this movie Daisy's destruction, if it even existed, wasn't going to be released anytime soon. Enters Lux. Lux set out on a mission to see if A, the video was real, and B, if it was real, could he secure a copy for So him? Lux started as a good guy, but was, but was flipped. So into the, into the top dog, apparently, right? That's what they said about him, right? himself to release on her to the core. He quickly discovered that Daisy's destruction was in fact real, and the sources who told him it was real pointed looks in the direction of an online user called Excitego, who claimed that they had a copy. Excitego would go on to explain that they were the owner of a company by the name of No Limits Fun, a hurtcore production company that mainly focused on young Asian girls. The user, Excitego, would turn out to be They going through they gotta make LLCs and businesses and do this and do that and like these are real life try hard weird
weirdos. You put the, the maximum effort into this. Like, go do something productive. Like, you could probably cure cure any world-renowned disease, but instead you doing this. A man by the name of Peter Scully. For those of you who aren't familiar with Peter Scully, back in 2011, he fled from his home country of Australia and headed to the Philippines after being involved in a property fraud scheme that fleeced more than $2.7 million from 20 different investors. After spending a while in the Philippines, Peter would acquire himself two Filipina girlfriends, Carme and Alvarez and Lizelle Margello Castana and together they would approach parents in impoverished neighborhoods with offers of education and food for their children. They would take the kids under their wing. What the parents weren't aware of though, was that they were about to hand their children over to monsters. The trio would give the children a false sense of security when first arriving at a property rented out by Peter. For example, by offering them something to eat. But the mask would eventually slip and the children would be subjected to days months and even years of torture and rape. Some of these instances would go on to be caught on camera and sold on Peter's child pornography site, No Limits Fun. The most infamous of Scully's video collection? None other than Daisy's Destruction, a multi-part video series that featured the rape and torture of three girls, 11-year-old Cindy, 12-year-old Liza, and Daisy, just 18 months old. Only Liza and Daisy Daisy would go on to survive, although Daisy continues to suffer with life-changing injuries, both physically and mentally. That meant then that Cindy would die at the hands of her abusers. When investigators finally located her body some three years after she was murdered, they found her in a shallow grave beneath a house that Peter Scully had been renting. She'd been forced to dig her own grave and was then strangled to death. All of this was said to have been caught on camera according to authorities. However, it's unclear if the murder was a feature on Daisy's destruction. With the video series going somewhat viral due to the nature of the content, it quickly landed in the hands of Dutch police, who determined that it was shot in the Philippines. They then handed their evidence over to local authorities, and a task force was opened to find the perpetrator. Although they understood a white Australian male was their key suspect, it was hard to pinpoint exactly who it was. As part of their operation in order to eliminate suspects... How many white Australian men is it in the Philippines? Investigators went door to door for months to see if the interior of people's homes matched what was in Daisy's destruction. Ultimately, law enforcement in the Philippines wouldn't be able to locate the house they were looking for, and all the leads policing. they were investigating were dead ends. However, there'd be a break in the case just as it was going somewhat cold. Two of Peter's victims would come forward to police after recently escaping. Carme let them go after she had felt sorry for them. Over the course of five days, the two victims had been subjected to multiple rounds of rape and torture. They told police that they had attempted to escape within the first couple of days, but were caught in the process. And as punishment, Peter made the pair dig their own graves. Who knows, they could have been the next murder victims. Peter Scully was eventually tracked down by law enforcement after going on the run for months. When he was captured, he was charged with 75 offenses that were split into two separate cases. The first covered Peter and Carmi. They both faced one count of human trafficking and five counts of rape by sexual assault of underage girls. In 2018, I hope they figured more and more out and piled them higher and higher. He, like, there should be a special, like, they need to build a, no. Nah. Put them in Rikers Island or something. Put these type people in the worst jail possible. The pair were found guilty on all charges that were put against them. They were both sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. That's good. Well, I was just about to ask, why is he smiling? Like, what's funny? The second covered Peter and Lizelle. 
They both faced 69 counts of various offences ranging from murder to the production and distribution of child pornography on the dark web. In 2022, the pair were found guilty on all the charges that were placed against them. Peter was handed a 129-year prison sentence, Lizo, 126. I had less than $2,000. So forever. Forever sentences. Lux would open up negotiations with Peter Scully in order to purchase the full video of Daisy's destruction, offering him $900 in Bitcoin that was swiftly rejected. I could sell this for up to $10,000 through private networks. However, I could create more custom videos for her to the core if we enter a long-term business relationship. But as Lux's business model wasn't based on monetary gain, rather content for content, negotiations broke down. Lux simply couldn't afford to pay for the video, and so the two went their separate ways. Eventually, Lux managed to secure himself four short extracts of Daisy's destruction, a total of 12 minutes worth of footage from other sources. All were released on Hurt to the Core at once, free to all members as revenge for the deal falling through. Those NLF guys deserved me leaking Daisy's destruction. They were whiny bitches. With Daisy's destruction now out in the- They got ops? They got business ops? They got, they beefing about this? He opened, looked and pushed the boundaries. He felt untouchable. So much in fact, he had this message for law enforcement when they eventually shut down Freedom Hosting. Well, it looks like this empire hasn't fallen yet. To any law enforcement agency who may be reading this, Fuck you. You cannot keep us down. And every time you try, we'll just get bigger and bigger. So thanks for the publicity and leading more pedophiles to where you can't catch them. To my fellow pedos, it won't be long now until all of the major CP sites are back up and running. In the meantime, I suggest you spend your newfound free time by going out and fucking some kiddies. Although Lux had felt untouchable for a while, for some reason... What did they do to him when they caught him? In June of 2014, he got spooked and felt law enforcement were closing in. So he made the decision to send an email to the FBI's cyber tip line, offering up details about his users. My name is Lux and not only do I run the largest online suite of child pornography websites on tour, but I also have knowledge about its users and their identities, unrivaled by anyone out there. I'm willing to hand over control of my empire, including administration details for all sites under the pedo empire, and server details as well as access to my emails. On top of that, I also have complete control over the large group of proven producers on any site. I'm sure that access to this, let alone every Everything else I'm offering you is merit for the conditions I will outline below. The conditions immunity? include $50,000 in Bitcoin and immunity across. Bro, really ask for $50,000 in Bitcoin, which is a lot now it is. But that's, this is, that, that, they, ain't, they ain't do this, did they? Jurisdictions. To no surprise, the FBI didn't budge. They weren't interested in giving in to either demand. Right. It's clear you're not taking my offer seriously. It's not a game. These are real lives you're bargaining on. It's now clear that if I want to fix this problem, I need to do it myself. I will get rid of these people because no one else will. As you don't want to be a part of the solution, I bid you farewell. After contact was made with the FBI, Lux announced to his inner circle that he would be closing down Pedo Empire. When the word spread, some reports say that Sickos reacted by posting child abuse images online in his honor. On June 24th, 2014, true to his word, Lux closed Pedo Empire. As always, all empires eventually fall, and today is the day that it falls. After years of running CP hidden services, today is the day that I walk away. There are personal issues which my close friends have been made aware of that have forced me to make this decision. I don't like awkward farewells, so goodbye. Regards, Lux. If you try to look online for a reason as to why Lux abruptly closed Pedo Empire, you're normally met with two answers. The first, so they never caught this guy Lux. It is a report claiming that he closed it due to, quote, personal issues, like he stated in his goodbye note. Those personal issues were later revealed as a suspected brain tumor. The other is... That see, see what I'm saying? That man above not gonna just let you do this. He gonna get you.
there is no answer. It states for some reason he closed it. It doesn't go any further than that. But when you connect the dots, a potential answer is there, and it's far from a brain tumor. It's actually connected to another dark net user by the name now? of Ski. If you have an hour. Okay, so we okay, we getting the facts then. Ski, aka Shannon McCool, was a prolific pedophile and owner of the Love Zone, a darknet child abuse site which we've spoke about earlier on in this video. It had been home to over 50,000 members, including the likes of Richard Huckle. If you wanted to become a member, you were required to upload hardcore child exploitation material as a rite of initiation. By 2014, the site had surpassed Lilita City as the biggest child abuse site on the darknet. If you've seen my video covering Richard Huckle, then you'll know that Task Force Argos, a branch of the Queensland Police in Australia tackling online child abusers, brought the love zone down along with Shannon and a few higher ups on the site in 2014. Their investigation into the love zone began as the result of an operation carried out by Canadian police back in 2010. Initially, it didn't involve Australian authorities. Dubbed Project Spade, law enforcement in Toronto, Canada were looking into a man known as Brian Way, a 42-year-old who had a production crew in different countries across Eastern Europe. They had been filming what's called naturist videos of children. In other words, artistic films that featured nude boys aged between 5 and 12 years old. There was a loophole though, as they weren't of a quote sexual nature, the police couldn't actually do anything about it. An investigation would be opened into Brian back in the early 2000s after police received complaints about the films his production crew were making, but as you know police couldn't do anything about it, so no charges were ever brought forward. The movies would go on to be sold around the globe through Brian's website, azorfilms.com. The business went on to make millions. Customers would use their credit cards to make purchases. At the height of its popularity, over 2 million people visited the site. In 2010, the police investigated Brian once again, although initially he wouldn't be a specific target. You see, police had begun to investigate a person who was sharing extreme child pornography images online, and when that person was identified, it was none other than Brian Ray. Right. Not only was he sharing extreme child pornography images online with other pedophiles, police soon discovered that some of his movies wouldn't be classed as legal artistic films either, rather child pornography. In May of 2011, police raided Brian's warehouse. Up to 45 terabytes of child exploitation material that had been produced by Azov Films over the span of nearly a decade had been present. To put that into perspective, it took tens of police officers four full days, yes, that's 24 hour days, to remove the content from the warehouse. Brian would be charged and subsequently found guilty on 15 counts. It took them four days. Man said four days to get the stuff out there. I don't understand, like, this is, like, I feel like they've, they, they, were they just naturally like this and then they seen the business side of it and it was lucrative enough for them to be full blown, 100% all in business weirdos or, like, how do you even, like, what is the, like, come on, bro. Counts <laughs> of possessing, publishing, and selling videos of naked, prepubescent, and pubescent boys, and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. However, that sentence would be cut to just 7 years and 10 months after he told the appeal judge that he was being abused in jail. When the secret operation was announced, So what? When he told the appeal judge he was being abused, so what? That's karma to the public on November 14th, 2013, it was clear that this wasn't just a Canadian operation, rather a worldwide one. Canadian police managed to track down 328 customers from around the world. And so once they were identified, they passed the information on to their international counterparts. Good morning, everybody. It's Toronto I'd like police. to talk about Project Spade this morning. In October 2010, undercover online officers with the child exploitation section of the Toronto Police Service I'm going to keep it 100%. If I was a police officer, I would never be. But if I was, if I, was I could never do an undercover act thing like this. It, I just couldn't. It, it's too much. Made contact with a male on the internet. I get it. You're doing a good thing, but like. Of young children being sexually abused. 
Through investigations, the officers were able to trace the internet connection to a male living in Toronto. The investigation revealed that this individual was running an exploitation movie production and distribution company from an address within the city of Toronto. This company operated a website known as www.azoffilms.com where customers from around the world could place orders to have movies sent to them through the mail or through the internet. Investigators believe many of these movies were consistent with the Canadian Criminal Code definition of child pornography. At this time, the Toronto Police Service sought the assistance of the United States Postal Inspection Service as it appeared many of the movies were being exported into the United States. The Toronto Police Service and the United States Postal Inspection Service then began a joint investigation. On May 1, 2011, after a seven-month-long investigation, officers executed numerous search warrants at various locations across the city of Toronto. One of these search warrants was executed at the site of the purported business located in the west end of Toronto. Officers spent four days inside this business, cataloging the thousands of movies, computers, and other media located during their search. At this time, over 45 terabytes of information was seized from the business. And to give you some perspective, this is equivalent to a stack of paper as tall as 1,500 CN Towers. CN Towers, that's the one in Dubai, right? The tallest building in the world. 1,500 of... On the same date, a search warrant was also executed at the residence of the owner-operator of the business, Mr. Brian Way. It is alleged that officers located hundreds of thousands of images and videos detailing horrific sexual acts against very young children, some of the worst that they have ever viewed. Brian Way, 42 years ago... I could tell she's getting frustrated reading this. See, that'd be me. I'd be too angry to read this. ...of age has been charged with a total of 24 offenses... How old? Brian Way, 42 years of age, has been charged with a total of 24 offenses, including numerous child pornography, proceeds of crime offenses, and instructing a criminal organization. We believe this is the first time in Canada that anyone has been charged with being a part of a criminal organization in regards to child pornography. It is alleged that Mr. Way's company had revenues in excess of $4 million during the years he was operating. It is also alleged that Mr. Way paid people to have children filmed in Eastern European countries in order to produce some of the movies that he would sell online. These producers of the child exploitation movies which were sold exclusively through Azov Films have all been convicted in their respective countries. With the assistance of the Toronto Police Services technical, techn, Technological Tech Section, <laughs> officer I don't find it funny. I get it. You miss, you can't say a word, but you know what I'm saying? I, there's not, I'm not laughing in that situation. We're able to recreate the... Wipe the smile off your face customer database um, used by Azov Films to distribute the material around the world. Child exploitation officers with the assistance from the members of the Ontario Provincial Strategy to protect children from sexual abuse and exploitation on the internet then spent months analyzing all the seized material, determining who the customers were. Information was then sent through the RCMP's National Child Exploitation Coordination Centre and Interpol to over 50 countries. This investigation was dubbed Project Spade and its success has been extraordinary. To date, the project as a whole has saved 386 children from sexual abuse worldwide. This alone is spectacular. One child's life save is amazing. 386, amazing, but I'm sure. Furthermore. There's a lot going on out here, man. That's what I'm saying, man. Don't be that parent that's too lenient. I'm telling you, do not be that parent that is too lenient in 2023 in, this, in today's age. I'm not that parent. Don't even look at my daughter for too long or I'm, I'm, I'm questioning you. What are you looking at? Okay, look that way. That's enough, my dude. As of this morning, the That's number me. has I don't actually care. gone up. Sweden um, contacted us and advised us that they arrested seven more people for this project. So 348... And believe you me, I'm checking women and men the same way. Don't look at my daughter too long. Don't be play, play, play too much. Like, individual. we don't know you. Even if we know you, I don't trust you. Individuals <laughs> have been arrested worldwide as part of the investigation. 
They include 50 in Ontario, 58 in the rest of Canada, 76 in the United States, and 164 internationally. Of concern to the investigators was the number of people that had close contact with children. The arrests included 40 school teachers, This is why you got to talk to your kids, man. Talk to your kids. Make sure they know right and wrong. Make sure they know. Because I'm for sure to let my hey, no. Nine doctors and nurses. 32 people who volunteered with children. Six law enforcement personnel. Nine pastors or priests. And three foster parents. Well, an example of uh, one What's of the up, searches Cinderella? was conducted in Canada. A uh, search warrant was executed at a retired school teacher's residence. He had over 350,000 images and over 9,000 videos of child sex sexual abuse. Some of these images were of children known to him, and he was also charged with sexually abusing a young child relative. We worked with several international law enforcement agencies during this project. Australian Federal Police, who are here today, Spanish National Police here today, Special Investigations Unit for the Investigation of Trafficking in Mexico also here today, Queensland Police Service, Task Force Argos, South African Police Service. I'm telling you, I, 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 I had, I'm telling you, there was this girl in my high school. This was sophomore year, I think sophomore year or junior year, my junior year. So yes, we are, un we are children still. And there was a security, because she used to always wear, like, you know, when the times was in, the little tube top with the little jean skirt. And she, it was an officer that, like, literally, I seen him, like, she was going up the stairs, and I seen him running to go look up the stairs while she was, like, at the time, I was just like, he's weird. But now it's like, Yo, that's yeah, he's a he's one of them, and I might go see if he's still working at the school, cause I'm telling, <laughs> I'm telling for sure. Service, Hong Kong Police Service, Norwegian Police Service, Garda, Ireland Police Service, National Police Force of Greece, and Royal Gibraltar Police. The success of this joint project with the United States Postal Inspection Service, along with all our international partners and other agencies you see here today, confirms that when we work together, regardless of the borders that divide us, we can successfully track down those who not only prey on our most vulnerable, but also profit from it. I would like to thank everyone involved and commend them for their hard work and commitment to this project. I would also like to acknowledge cybertip.ca, who is present, also present with us today. Cybertip.ca is Canada's tip line to report the online sexual exploitation of children. They received numerous tips regarding Mr. Way's website and forwarded them to us, assisting us in detecting his web website. Thank you. So this is where Task Force Argos comes into play. When they got intel that some Australians had been purchasing child exploitation movies from Brian Way, they set out on making multiple arrests. There was one arrest in particular though that would open a Pandora's box. When Task Force Argos arrested this particular person who's been named as Mr. Smith and seized his computer, they noticed that he encrypted certain parts of it. However, he made the thankful mistake of leaving all of his dark web login details on an unencrypted note. The login details would lead police down a dark net rabbit hole and ultimately led them to the love zone. It was uncharted territory. Mr. Smith was a VIP member, meaning he had been uploading at least 4 gigabytes of preteen hardcore child abuse content to the site every 30 days. He had to keep this up or he would have his VIP status stripped from him. When police got into the love zone, they realized they only had a few weeks at best to stay on the site. So task for- That's one of the weirdest things, you hear me? Like, that's weird. Like, you had, there was a reward point system for being a VIP member. You had to do this in order to be VIP. And people was VIP, they was really VIP. So they was out here committing crime and, and you know, taking kids' innocence and doing all of this and that. Like, that's, that's weird. Anybody running these sites and having those type of rewards, you need life in prison. You need to send them to Texas or Texas. 
Yeah. Force Argos had to approach a judge in order to get approved for something that's called a controlled operation. In other words, they were asking the judge for the go-ahead to legally be allowed to possess and distribute child exploitation material in order to stay on the website. The bigger picture was to bring down as many predators as they could. The judge would approve the operation, and it proved successful. In a nutshell, the operation consisted of police uploading content in order to keep their VIP status, meaning they could keep an eye on everyone, including the owner, Ski. Even though a covert operation was underway, it would be good old-fashioned detective work that would finally unmask Ski. You see, police noticed a pattern in the way Ski greeted the users in the VIP section of the Love Zone. He used the phrase hires, and although the general consensus is that this phrase is used by females, police knew they were dealing with a man because Ski was actively producing fresh child abuse material. He would be raping different children, seven to be exact. They also knew that Ski was an Australian because he made victims hold a piece of paper with the word Aussie written on it while they were being raped. Police had to act quick, and so Task Force Argos team member Paul Griffiths, a victim identification specialist, punched in the phrase hires on Google. 450,000 results were returned, but to Paul's surprise, within the first few pages, the phrase hires had been used by a man on an Australian forum board about trucks. He was asking for advice about raising the suspension to his VW utility. and had made the mistake of leaving his license plate bare. When police searched the license plate up, it was registered to a man by the name of Shannon McCool. Police were now confident enough that they had finally caught Ski. So, they made their move. And to no surprise, they captured the right man. Good morning, everyone. David Waterford, Waterford from Families SA and I will brief you about an alleged defender who appeared before the Adelaide Magistrates Court on the 10th of June this year and he remains in custody. Damn. <laughs> I wasn't muted for that long, right? I was just, just the last, just the last portion y'all seen was muted, right? I said that guy that was saying hiya. Did y'all hear me say that part? Hiya. I said, I don't want to hear the word no more. Just say hello to me. <laughs> I said, a lot of people in the UK be saying hiya to me. And I understand that that's the lingo, but. And then I was saying, um, that guy, Ski, um, that's the dude that I had, um, that I just did a reaction to him when this video came out. And I was like, oh, he's on the thumbnail. It's probably the same video, but it's, this is not the same video. ...today. This offender was employed within Families SA in a role caring for young children at the time of this offending. Loki, if I wasn't on live, I would have probably been muted for a lot longer. That's tough. <laughs> you will appreciate that the information we can provide you is limited because of the ongoing police investigation that is being conducted into this serious criminal offence. I remind everyone that there is a court suppression order in place, as well as the usual operation of the Evidence Act, which prohibits the publication of certain information in proceedings for a sexual offence. On the 6th of June this year, Special Crimes Investigation Branch investigators received information concerning the dissemination of child exploitation material. Due to the serious nature of that information provided at this time, investigators searched the domestic premises in the metropolitan area of Adelaide on the 9th of June. As a direct result of that search, investigators arrested a male adult who is charged with seven counts of unlawful sexual intercourse with young children in his care. He is also charged with the production, possession and dissemination of child exploitation material. At the time of entering the premises, police were not aware of any contact offending between the alleged offender and the child victims. 
The focus of the investigation up until that time related to the possession and dissemination of child exploitation material. At the time of the arrest, police became aware of alleged contact offending between the alleged offender and the children. This evidence led to seven charges of unlawful sexual intercourse. When these seven charges were laid on the 10th of June, investigators were not aware of the identities of the seven victims. We were not aware of the location of the offences, nor were we aware of the time frame of that offending. Since that time, specialist sex crime investigators have been working closely with our computer specialists in an attempt to identify the young victims. This analysis has been tireless and has involved the examination of over 100,000 steel photographs and 600 video files containing child exploitation material. This part of the investigation is not complete and it still has a long way to go before it can be completed. Late on Wednesday of last week, with the assistance of Families SA, the investigators identified seven victims. The victim identification process has been slow and very tedious, as it has involved comparing the images of the child victims contained within the child exploitation material against documentary material provided to us by Families SA. This process has been made even more problematic as some of the child exploitation images were partial images only. Since the alleged offender's arrest, the focus of this investigation has been the identification of the victims, and that remains today. It is important to identify the victims so that appropriate counselling and medical support can be provided to these victims, their parents or guardians. Investigators and Families SA are now in the process of informing the parents of the seven children of the circumstances of the alleged offences and the identity of the alleged offender. Full support from Police, Families SA and the Child Protection Services will be, will be provided to the parents and guardians of these children. This investigation has been a priority for the police and will remain a priority. Man, if these charges carried the same weight as like, like drug charges, because right now I feel like these people just running wild, doing whatever, because the charges is not what they're supposed to be most of the time. We still have a significant amount of computer analysis to be conducted with the clear objective to identify all victims of the- But in something like this, there's a whole rink and a whole empire and this and that, like they charging crazy. They, they doing an appropriate amount of charging. I don't want to see no charge on this screen lower than 20 years. I don't care if you even looked at a picture, you, you, can, you need 20 years. This abuse. Oh God. This investigation is being led by SAPOL and will continue, continue until we have identified all possible offences and the identity of any further possible victims. Due to the complexity and the enormity of the data to be analysed, this investigation may take many months before it is completed. But, rest assured, our investigation will remain victim focused. This, this investigation can be best described as being horrific. It is horrific for the young victims and their families, and it is deeply disturbing for the police who are required to view these images. I now pass on to David. Well, do your job. Eh? Like I said, I could never be the police officer that's viewing them images. That's tough. Um, he almost should get charged as well. I know you're doing a job, but listen, hey. Um, what was I going to say? What was I gonna, no, I was going to say something. Oh, yeah, man, you got to look at the PTSD factor and all of this as well. These children is literally scarred for life, for life. It's, it's for life. They're going to become an adult and they're going to have, like, hyper drives, like, hyper SEX drives. Like, there's going to be a lot going on. Like, 
or they can just shut themselves out from the world. There could be psychologically some stuff could be like it's gonna be wild. And I just hope throughout their entire lives they can get the help that they need. Shannon McCool had been a government approved social Look at this guy. There's no facial hair. This is a red flag immediately. He's been a government approved what? Okay, well I'm to dive it. Shannon McCool had been a government approved social care worker looking after vulnerable children, some who had previously been sexually abused. Many complaints had been made about him in the past about his inappropriate behavior towards children, but ultimately those complaints were swept under the rug. For three years, he went huh? on to sexually abuse seven children while he was taking care of them as a government approved social care worker. One of the victims had been a young disabled boy and another an 18 month old toddler. All are thought to have been under the age of 12. That's a fact. In the comments they say, in the, in the chat, she say, uh, if you destroy a life, a child's life, then you, then the person should be doing life in jail, 25 years, solid, 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 solidarity, solidarity. <laughs> I ain't gonna say the last part, but I'll let y'all read it. District Court, South Australia, August 2015. This this timeline started. Good evening. This timeline started in 2008, right? Victims have cheered in court as family's SA carer Shannon McCool was jailed for three decades for inflicting vile sexual abuse on already troubled children. McCool, who was also the kingpin of a global child porn. No, it's crazy. Already troubled killed children. Like, what was bro's thought process? Not even bro. What was dude thought process? network was described by the judge as a worldwide evil like he'd never seen before. Shannon McCall needs... He's definitely evil because he got a job with... Like, he had a job that gave him all the access that he ever needed. He sought out for this job type. Like, he went to college, got a degree for this specific reason. Like, he's been like this for his whole life. He was like, I'm going to grow up and be like this, continued, it, like. Protection from other inmates in jail. I'm not even, I might sign bogus when I say this, and it, 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 I know it's a double-edged sword, like it could go both ways, man and female, but when I see men working with children, I, 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 I'm very skeptical of it. I'm no offense, no offense, but this is why, like, like y'all got to understand, like, like, I be like, uh-uh. That'd be red flag for me. That's me personally. Men working for children. With the children here. Like volunteer jobs that are required for you to be around children and you're not a teenager. Like, and you're a grown man volunteering to be around kids. Like, that, for me, I don't know. It just do something wrong to me. It do something in my brain where I'm like, I don't trust the situation. Abused were denied that right under his care. Instead, he stole their innocence in the most sickening of ways, and he'll now pay with the next 35 years of his life. I've got no remorse for him at all. No. I, I hope that he gets what he deserves. McCall cried as Judge Paul Rice described in harrowing detail the repulsive crime. What did he cry for? Was inflicted on seven children. The former family. See what I'm saying? Lee's SA carer was trusted to look after them in a government run residential facility. But when one of the state's heaviest sentences was imposed on him, the courtroom erupted into applause. It's over in one Good. part of it's over, and now it's I can deal with our family trauma. McCall's victims were as young as 18 months. Some were disabled, all were vulnerable. It's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. But who babies McCool he uploaded hold? uploaded hundreds of thousands of videos and images to his depraved website, which fed an international market of more than a thousand pedophiles. As website CEO, McCall boasted and encouraged others to post their own sickening material. It was horrible to hear. It, it, I can't understand anyone can act that way. 
Nor could Judge Rice. In fact, he struggled with the gravity of McCool's insidious behaviour, saying no case has ever come close. Yours is a worldwide evil well beyond my judicial experience. Some people may describe your crimes as sick, but I prefer evil and depraved. You have no moral compass. It's very evil. Like just, just look at how it's laid out. Bro was a child, grew up, went to college specifically to get this type of job because this is already fermenting in him. He went to college, worked with children at probably as a, at a, at a, at a, as a 18, 19 year old, went to college. Like, oh, I got to be closer. I got to, I got to, you feel what I'm, you get what I'm saying? Like, it's premeditated from age, fifth, from age 17. And then you got a job with deprived, like, like, you got that specific job with those children who are already at risk, targeted them. I'm talking 18 months to however old they said, disabilities and all, like. It's been emotional the whole time, but this time it was just, yeah, wow. 33-year-old McCall will be 61 before he has any chance of parole. The judge doubtful the pedophile can ever change his ways. What is plain is that the impact on these children is not in the past. It is immediate, ongoing and unfolding as they grow up. And I'm hoping... Same thing I said. ...that my grandson will never lay eyes on him again. Shannon McCall's 35-year prison sentence was reduced to 28 in April. He agreed to help Danish authorities take down other admins of the... the he got seven years off of that. I mean, okay. With Ski now in police custody, it was time for Task Force Argos to take over the love zone and bring down other members. One of those, none other than Lux. Exactly two weeks after Shannon McCool had been arrested, Lux would go on to announce that he was closing his pedo empire down. Somewhere along the line, did Lux and Ski have a secret code that would pull the plug on everything if either suspected that police had overtaken their accounts? For example, if Lux said a certain phrase to Ski, Ski would have to give a certain answer. Or maybe Lux just had a hunch that something was off and decided to delete every trace of his online activity. It wouldn't be too hard to suggest either one was true because reports say that many higher-ups within the love zone noticed that Ski, now operated by law enforcement, had started to speak and act differently. None of that would matter though because what Lux didn't realise was that even though he had ended his pedo empire, the police had connected it to his home address. Little mm. is known about the operation and how law enforcement managed to make the connection. All we know is that it was discovered after they had taken- It don't even matter. It was The connection was made. Let's go get them. ...over the love zone. August 26, 2014, police are about to swoop on a house in Melbourne, Australia. They were about to come face to face with the most hated man on the dark net. To the police's understanding, the property was owned by a white working class male in his 50s, a mechanic who lived there with his wife, son and daughter. They thought for sure that he was Lux. But as police began to tear the house apart, looking for the computer that hosted one of the most disgusting sites on the dark web, they instantly knew it wasn't the father because he had no idea of how to even operate a computer. Their focus soon turned to the son, Matthew David Graham. 22-year-old Matthew David Graham, a nanotech student with no social life, liked to spend his days indoors playing games such as World of Warcraft. That was his form of social interaction. In his life away from- I'm not gonna lie, man. I just heard a lot of red flags. Like, these are all- These be red flags. I'm, I'm letting y'all know how I be thinking. Like, when I hear this stuff or when I see people that do this, this right here, hold on. Matthew David Graham. 22-year-old Matthew David Graham, a nanotech- Nanotech student with no social life. No social life. If like to spend his days indoors. Like to spend his days indoors. Playing games such as World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft. That was his form of. It's full red flags for me, man. Now, no, you could be doing these things definitely, and be innocent, but don't just know. Me personally, I'm looking. Because there's something about you that we don't know. Clearly.
of social interaction. I'm not saying everybody is like this. That's not what I'm saying at all, you two. But I'm saying in my day-to-day life, when I do, when I see these things in people, I'll be like, man, hey. <laughs> in his life away from a computer screen. You either want to, like, I ain't going to say you either one or two things, but like two, one of two things comes to mind when I hear that. And this one is what this video is about, and the other one is something just as bad. He seemed like an average university student. However, as you know, he was hiding a dark secret. At the age of 18, he began exploring child exploitation websites on the dark web. Over the span of roughly three years, he created the most horrific child abuse websites at his parents' home. They were none the wiser. When police raided Matthew's house on that morning in August of 2014, It's crazy. His parents like don't even like how did they can't even defend their son? Like like. Oh no, that's my son. I love him. Like, no, I don't even. You're disowned. Get out. Or you're going to get out. You're going to jail. So, <laughs> so. Did ask him to. You know how parents be like, oh, that's my son. I'm going to be with him in jail. Like, he's in jail. Like, I got to. Like, I don't do. Are they in still con- contact with the man? Unlock his laptop and PC, but he refused. However, he would hand over his phone and passcode for it. An initial search of the phone brought up nothing, but three hurtcore related images would emerge after detectives took a deep dive into the device's cache. As the result of this find, Matthew would initially be arrested and charged for possessing child abuse material and failing to hand over his passcodes. No further charges were added at that time though because police had no evidence. All they had was the lead that led to the address. Matthew's PC and laptop would be shipped off to Europol in Germany and the FBI in America to see if they could get into them. They already knew Matthew Graham was Lux, but they needed the data from the devices as they had stored the evidence they needed. For a while, both struggled, but eventually the FBI would find their way inside and there was the evidence they were searching for. Australian detectives would go on to give Matthew two options upon discovery of the findings. Either A, plead guilty in Australia and hand over the passcode to the other device, or B, face a potential extradition to America. I, I guarantee you he handed over that passcode. Boy, you don't want to go to America. You do not want to about that American prison system. I guarantee you he pled guilty and he gave that password. Up. Where he had been facing separate charges, he settled for the former. Yeah, I guess I, I wanted to be part of something. And so I made it up. The sexualization was never anything I was interested in. It was the power within the pedophile community. On the 30th Man, hell no. he was a pedo himself. of July 2015, just under a year after his arrest, Matthew was charged with 88 offenses, which covered a wide range of crimes. But by the time he was sentenced in March... If- power is a strange drug, though. Like, he was the top dog in that community. That is a power... Like... He's addicted to power. Strange, weird type stuff, but... 2016, he was only sentenced for 13 of the original 88 after he struck up a deal with the prosecution. Those 13 charges included crimes such as hosting and distributing child exploitation material, encouraging the kidnap, rape, and murder of the five-year-old Russian girl and encouraging the rape of the seven-year-old disabled girl in America. During Matthew's sentencing hearing, the judge presiding over the case was extremely hesitant about viewing some of the material that was hosted on Hurt to the Core. No but cap, the prosecution advised too. that the judge needed to watch at least small clips of Daisy's destruction without audio to get an idea of the horrific content that Matthew had allowed on the site. That way, it would help the judge with what sentence to hand down. The judge agreed. How any human can view that impassively, the infant was being tortured. Actual physical torture. An extremely trusting, vulnerable child who begins smiling, wearing a nappy, and ends a wailing physical wreck. I've seen some shocking things over the journey of my career, and I've never seen anything like that. After the viewing, the judge was said to have appeared pale and looked disorientated. On the 17th of March 2016, Matthew David Graham was handed a 15 and a half year prison. 
My bad. I said, the, I know y'all can hear that in the background, that beating on the door. Like, somebody's doing construction. That's why it's muted. But um, I said, the way the judge described it, yeah, I don't know. Like, it makes me sad. I said, I don't know if it makes me sad or it makes me angry, which it really makes me both. Prison sentence with the minimum term of 10 years. I'm going to share with you he got what? Exactly how all those. He got a life sentence with a minimum term of 10 years. Yo. Matthew David Graham was orientated. On the 17th of March 2016, Matthew David Graham was handed a 15 and a half year prison sentence with the minimum term of 10 years. Oh my. God, that's a dis that's one of the most disappointing sentences that I've heard today in this in this in this one. Ten years, he good. Fifteen years, he's definitely out. So ten years, he gonna be on good behavior. He gonna be. He was considered the worst administrator of some of the worst websites in the world at the time. So he should get more time. He made it possible. He, and he like promoted like what was happening. We knew who the user was, we just had to make the connection to um, that Lux was Matthew Graham. When I first saw him on the day that we served the warrant, I was surprised by his confidence, that he was quite calm in that environment. In his mind, I can't imagine how that would have been going, him thinking, have they got me? Because um, obviously there's a bit of bluff. What we've got, what we don't have, not all our cards are played at the time. The level of and the type of content that he was dealing with was, it was considered the worst in the world by FBI, by Europol. It was hard. And got a 15 year sentence. You hear what she's saying right now, man? The worst in the world and got 15 years. Core, hurt core material. So torture and abuse of babies, mainly through to I think about 12. He was surprising. When it got to the interview, how candid and open he was to talk about that level of depravity. That it didn't, didn't flinch, it just rolled off his tongue what he was talking about. It was staggering to think that the, you know, the FBI and Europol are all tracing Lux, who is he, where is he, and lo and behold, he's here. And he's a 21 year old. Lux in some ways stands out and in some ways just like um, the other darknet pedophiles that I spoke to. Um, a lot of people I know ask why would someone like this speak to a member of the media and I think that one of the ways that he's just like the other people um, in this community is that he needs someone to speak to. He's still a human being and this is a secret that they keep and um, they saw me as someone who they could safely speak to. Um, and so you could get that sense from him the same way you could get that sense from the other pedophiles in the dark net. Uh, he was different, I think, in that he was uh, singularly hated by other pedophiles. Um, I hadn't met too many other people who even like entire communities of other pedophiles really, really despised. Uh, Lux was hated in the pedophile community because because he promoted hurtcore, which is um, a genre within a genre, right? It's a genre of child pornography in which the idea is that the kid is getting hurt and hit and ab abused beyond. Whoa, what the, what the, what, what? Okay, entire communities are hate him also because he's promoting hurt. You're a pedo. You're destroying a child's life. You're hurting them, too. Well, I don't see no difference in neither one of y'all. Y'all all the same. Not y'all. I'm saying these, 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 the, these, the entitlement of they, they, that is all the same. I understand that you're doing worse, but what's worser than worse? You're already at the top. Uh, beyond the normal level of, of abuse of child pornography. Um, and that is something that a not insignificant amount of people enjoy, but that even more other pedophiles hate. Um, the 
it it's funny to call them that, but the mainstream pedophiles um, basically think of this as abhorrent because as part of their the justification of their um, actions, uh, they see themselves as uh, part of child love. They see themselves as doing what's right for the child, what the child wants. And while that is a, uh, requires its own twisted sense of justification, um, it's another level of... I can't believe what I'm hearing. I know he's just telling the story is how he hears it out, out, the, out the mouth, but that's wild. They really out there justifying their actions like that? It's another twist to say that the kid wants to be hit. Um, there, you know, there is no twist. The, the the people who enjoy hurt court for the most part get off on the fact that the kids are not enjoying it, and that is to even most pedophiles really abhorrent. The dark secret. There's more. First off, I fully accept this offer may not be for everyone, so feel free to say no, but my offer is as follows. I would be interested in requesting photographs from you of yourself, either topless or in the nude. In exchange for this, I would be willing to pay between 300 to 800 pounds. It's a bit of a background, i.e. why is this perv asking me for these pictures? I certainly wouldn't go as far as to call myself an artist, but I love to draw, mostly in charcoal, and the images I would ask you to produce would be the sort of thing that most inspires me. Absolutely nobody besides myself would ever see them. Let me know if this is something of interest for you. Thank you for taking your time to read this. Was an email sent out by a person called Liz to various people who listed services such as babysitting and dog walking on Gumtree, a classified ads website. The people who listed were looking to earn a bit of cash on the side. A lot of the time it had been children in their early teens. So when the offer of quick money was there to help someone with an art piece, they jumped at the offer. What they didn't know though, was that once those images were sent, they'd be sucked into a blackmail scheme. If they didn't continue to send images that got more degrading as time went on, Liz would threaten to leak what material they had to people who knew of the victim. Whoever this Liz character was, did their due diligence in order to keep the blackmail scheme going. After targeting quite literally tens of children throughout 2012 and 2013, it was no surprise that police were fully aware of who Liz was. But the police had no way of figuring out Liz's true identity because Liz had used different means to hide any leads going back to them. In other words, they were a ghost. However, it wouldn't be too long before detectives in the United Kingdom connected Liz to a dark net site by the name of Hurt to the Core. Let's rewind. Earlier on in the video, we were discussing Hurt to the Core and some of the popular threads it contained. One of those was titled, Need Ideas for Blackmailed Girl, Aged 15. The FBI would figure out that the person behind the thread, in the garden, had been from the UK, and so they alerted their UK counterparts, the National Crime Agency, to give them a heads up about the discovery. Some point after this notification, a 15-year-old girl who fell victim to Liz's Gumtree blackmail scheme came forward to police, and after doing a cross-reference in the database, it was clear to detectives that the girl who had just came forward was the 15-year-old girl referenced in the thread on Hurt to the Call. Mm. The National Crime Agency had made the connection. In the garden, and Liz were the same person. The hunt was on. Well, not exactly. I basically had a needle in a haystack. There are 32 million UK males over the age of 18, so I had to reduce that down to one. It took four years for the National Crime Agency, working in collaboration with the GCHQ, the UK spy agency, the FBI, the US Department of Homeland Security, the Australian Federal Police, the New Zealand Police, and the Israel Police to finally figure out who in the garden was. They were a number one target. Over that four year period, Liz going un- the different names had continued their blackmail scheme on the surface web and when they received images and videos typically child pornography from a victim they posted that content on hurt to the core in the garden had posted that often they earned the title 
child rapist. That meant then that at a minimum, they posted 250 separate posts of hurt court images and videos relating to children before the site closed in 2014. After that, it's believed their offending continued elsewhere on the dark net, this time under the aliases Evil Mind and 666 Devil. Although all of these are correct. You gotta be, you gotta be, there gotta be some devil located inside of you for you to move like this. Reports don't state what websites they posted to, more than likely due to ongoing police investigations. It's thought that In the Garden approached up to 300 people as a part of their blackmail scheme. Hundreds would go on to fall victim. But in 2017, it would all come to an end. In March of that year, police had managed to trace the In the Garden, Evil Mind, and 666 Devil accounts to an address in Birmingham, England. However, detectives weren't too Birmingham? sure how strong the lead was because the person of interest didn't fit the profile of someone who typically posted such content on the dark net. They had to go undercover. Is this an undercover agent right here? Because this is a good one. That's 29-year-old University of Birmingham lecturer Dr. Matthew Folder being surveilled by the National Crime Agency. He was, oh. was their key suspect behind the dark net accounts. But Look like they fit the bill, for sure. Police say if you took a look at his life, you wouldn't have suspected that to be the case. He didn't necessarily fit the profile. Born in Nutsfield, Cheshire, Matthew Folder... See, I'm just going off with people like the eye test. For me, the eye test... It grew up in a 700... Fits. Fitting. You know what I'm saying? ...necessarily fit the profile. Born in Nutsfield, Cheshire, Matthew Folder had grown Fitting. in a £700,000 home with a stable family life. There were no reports of any abuse. He attended private school throughout his childhood. His parents rubbed shoulders with the movers and shakers. Without sounding like too much of a cliche, Matthew had the opportunity to do whatever he wanted because the financial freedom was there. He decided to settle for his education and excelled in school. He's featured here in a school letter stating that out of 75,000 students nationwide, he was one of the 4% that quote, struck gold in a maths competition. As part of beating that challenge, it granted him a place at the Maths Olympic Trials. He didn't feature on the school letter just once though, ladies and gentlemen, rather twice. On the next page, he was pictured with six other students who had completed interviews with the university of their choice and had all been accepted. Matthew chose to study natural sciences at the illustrious Cambridge University. He graduated with a master's degree. He was one of the finest students I'd ever supervised. His work had an international impact. Matthew reveled in the social side of university. He looked to impress his peers. He wasn't going to be that person. Not even gonna lie, like I can't, like I don't see it either. I don't see a lot of red flags from the, from like his background or anything like that. And who stayed inside all day studying, he wanted to be the life and soul of the party. What many didn't know though, was that behind the smiles and laughter lay a dark secret. That's Matthew Folder. As early as 2007, he'd been setting up hidden cameras in bathrooms at publicly accessible toilets. Oh, wow. He's one of these. And his parents' home, covertly recording females he both knew and didn't. In total, 27 videos were taken of eight victims over the period of a few years. This footage would initially be for personal use, but soon made its way onto the dark net in roughly 2009 when Matthew connected with like-minded individuals. Not much is known about his early days on the dark net other than he would trade that footage in return for different depraved material. 
Nearly a decade on, police had connected him to online accounts that posted some of the most horrific child abuse videos. When that connection was eventually made in 2017, a two-month surveillance operation was set up by the National Crime Agency. And by June of that year, they had more than enough evidence to suggest that he had been running the dark net accounts. What, what, so what, what was it I've done? Oh, what was it I'm supposed to have done? So, the, you... the offences that I've arrested you on suspicion of being involved in yep. were blackmail, causing or inciting a child to engage in sexual activity, possessing indecent images of children. Sounds like the rap sheet from hell. Dis distributing indecent images of Talking about sounds like a rap sheet from hell. What, look at your usernames. You should be familiar with them rap sheets. You know what's going on? Stop it. Buddy. The children and causing GBH injuries to a person. It's become apparent that obviously that's an email account that's current and you're using at this moment in time. Is that correct? No comment. Is there any other email accounts, Matthew, that you're using at the current time? No comment. Bro went from, hmm, no, sounds like the rap sheet from him, to no comment. Now you're a hardened criminal all of a sudden. If there are any more email accounts, what are the passwords? For no comment. Have you done that? No comment. Have you sent pictures of your blackmail victims to the parents? No comment. Of the victim, the grandparents? No comment. The workplace? No comment. The schools? No comment. Just because you say no comment don't mean they're not going to get you. Have you shared that with anybody else? No comment. Have mm -hmm. you distributed those images to um, any like-minded individuals on the forums we've discussed previously? No comment. Or with any other person? No comment. Did you get any sexual gratification? I'm not even going to lie. You asked me to watch Mr. Swirl. I can't even cap to you, man. It's going to be a month before I watch any more stuff like this. Mm -mm. No can't even no. can't even do it. Or was it a power and control thing, Matthew? No comment. Or was it humiliation? No comment. You but in a month say, we can watch it. Slow, you know, I know I'm hundred percent anonymous. How's that, Matthew? No comment. Initially, Matthew gave a no-comment interview to police, but on the third day of his arrest, in a prepared statement, he would go on to say that he owned the Evil Mind account, but that admission also meant he was the owner of In The Garden and 666 Devil. Matthew Folder would go on to be charged with 100 No comment. Initially, Matthew... Matthew gave a no-comment interview to police, but on the third day of his arrest, <laughs> Hey, my bad. Now, we got to start over now, because y'all need to understand what's going on statement. here. Go back. Go back. Okay, perfect. What I said was, let's take a look at this room here. No bed frame. A no comment interview. Dried up socks everywhere. What them for, you may ask? Y'all know what that for? To police. But on the third day of his arrest, look, look, in a look. prepared statement, he would go on to say that he owned the Let's evil keep going, keep going. But that admission also meant he was the owner of it. Boom. This right here? In the garden. It's crazy. Three glasses of water. None of them fully drinking. Exhibit A. Roll of tissue. Exhibit B. Look at how he was sitting up in the bed. Guilty. <laughs> I ain't gonna hold you. Guilt. Guilty. And 666 devil. Is these towels? This is a towel, y'all. This is a towel. He's guilty.
Matthew Folder would go on to be charged with 188 separate offences for crimes ranging from encouraging the rape of a minor to owning a paedophile manual which instructed paedophiles on how to carry out child sexual abuse and not be Was he streaming? ...be detected by police. He would go on to plead guilty to 100... Rag by the computer. ...137 out of the 188... charges that were placed against him. The rest are to lie on his file. On February 19th, 2018, Matthew Folder would be handed a 32-year prison sentence, but believe it or not, just eight months later, that sentence was reduced to 25 years after an appeal hearing. Why? He to serve two-thirds of that sentence before he's eligible for parole. Like, people wouldn't understand that it wasn't my fault how it started and that I didn't, didn't want to do it, but I felt that no one would understand because there was no one there. You said this man right here could have been watching normal PORN. Man, guilty. Sort of holding a knife to me saying, you will do this, even though it felt like that. So I didn't tell anyone. Them, 30, them 32 years. I don't talk to my family anymore. Guilty. I felt like they didn't, wouldn't understand and didn't understand what had happened to me. I got my day in court and I want everyone else to have that day. I want them to tell someone, to tell a friend, tell your parents, tell someone at work and to tell the police because they can, even if it takes a long time, find these people and they will, they, they will get punished. No, it's very difficult to understand a crime where, where the motive does not include um, uh, financial sex, gain, passion, uh, money or, or revenge or hate. Uh, when the sole motivation of an individual is purely to cause pain to another. That's quite hard to grasp. Evil. You, most crimes, you, there is, you can see the motive, you can, you not un accept the motive, you can, you can see where it comes from. But in this individual, the sole motivation was to inflict pain on another and the journey to that. Um, so it was all about the complete and total power and control over another person. When we identified Matthew Folder, that there was a real adrenaline rush. The problem is we have to make sure that, or I have to make sure that at the point at which I decide to take action, that A, I'm not putting anybody at risk. So the point of identifying is anybody at risk currently. Have I got enough to, to do that intervention? And have I got enough that when I do that intervention, I am gonna, gonna, going to stop his capability to commit further crimes. Some of the people affected by Dr. Fowler's behavior. And that's the only problem I be having with a lot of these sting operations that I be seeing on, on YouTube and things of that nature. Because um, they do this thing, they embarrass them on the internet, but you don't put yourself in a position to actually get them jail time or, you know what I'm saying? So, <clears throat> they still out here running free. That impact for some has been lifelong and for many of them, um, we've been able to offer them options of help <coughs> and support to start to move forward with hopefully a different chapter in their life and being able to safeguard them through the work that the organisation has me. done as part of the investigation um, has just been really, a long rewarding video. And really key. We didn't know who he was or where he was. Uh, so in terms of working over quite a prolonged period of time, knowing that there was likely harm that he was causing to people, but we weren't able to intervene and stop and protect. Oh. There were times when that was really challenging. Cold. Matthew Folder thought he wouldn't be caught. And I think he actually was probably the type of individual that would be telling people that he wouldn't be caught on the anonymous service and then living a completely different life in his day-to-day -day life. Um, ultimately, that wasn't the case. Ultimately, we, with our international partners, caught him. And with the help of the victims, we've put him in prison. So for us, this has been a relentless pursuit to catch Dr. Matthew Folder. Um, but what has saddened me is his relentless pursuit of the victims. And he would stop at nothing to exploit them to make them feel sad, humiliated, or unhappy. And he didn't really care in any way, shape, or form how that manifested. Um, ultimately, that has devastated uh, some people's lives. And I'm very proud of our team and also those victims for being able to stand up and stop him. So for me, the highs of this investigation are actually catching him and actually knowing that it stopped. Um, because like, when I sat in court um, behind some of the victims, 
I felt truly proud of them and I felt the journey that they've been on, we've actually been able to help them to end it. Um, in terms of the lows, there's been moments when I've been driving home thinking, is this going to end? How are we actually going to deal with this? And ultimately, you know, as a human being, that can be really tricky because you can see the abuse that's happening and you sometimes feel powerless to stop it. Ultimately, the high is that end point when it's stopped. So Matthew Folder is not alone in exploiting, grooming a black. I guess you got to take that in this job that they in right here because I be thinking like, man, y'all celebrating this one victory a little bit too hard, man. There's still millions. There's still a lot of work to be done out here when, the, when it comes to stuff like this. But I guess I, you got to like take every victory and hold it high in this field because if you don't, you're going to drive yourself crazy. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, not for too long. It's back to work, buddy. Many people. There's many other people out there who are doing that. However, Matthew Folder is part of a very small group of people that took it to an extreme where it was about absolute exploitation, about absolute pain, and about really the degradation of humans uh, within society. So, um, thankfully, he is quite rare, but there are others, and our job as the NCO is to catch them. Anonymous networks by their very definition in nature, are really, really tricky. Because what you've effectively got is a place where people can go, they can hide, and they can't be found. So of course, what that means, you've got to be innovative, you've got to use new and uh, different tactics, and ultimately, you've got to think around a very difficult problem. I'm really, really proud of the staff, and I think when you sometimes sit back and look at them working those long hours, um, and actually missing those home appointments and also just sometimes having to deal with really... Yeah, no cap, man. Good work. Good work. Good work. On to the next one. Depraved and disgusting material. Uh, I just think they're brilliant. And the sacrifices they've made for justice is truly impressive. Um, the large-scale offending... Crown prosecution service The speaking. most important aspects as a prosecutor that you have to deal with is to ensure that the court is given the accurate picture of the level of the person's offending and the scale of the offending. For it was sure. important to represent in the charges, however many, the nature of the different types of offences that Mr. Folder had committed. And it was important to represent every single victim that had been identified and for whom there was sufficient evidence. Welcome to the... Wait, what? Welcome to video. Look at the front of the video and the back of the video and the back of the video and the front of the video. IRS Criminal Investigation Special Agents Chris Jangwuski and Tigran Gambaran are sitting in Bangkok's Suvnaboom Airport ready to jet back home to Washington, D.C. after the successful arrest of Alexandra Casas, owner of the Alpha Bay, a darknet drugs marketplace that had grown 10 times as big as its predecessor, the Silk Road. Although successful, Chris and Tigran had been sidelined by their law enforcement counterparts in the FBI when it came to the arrest itself, an anticlimactic ending for a case they'd been working tirelessly on for years at that point. In fact, they hadn't even been invited to watch a live stream of the arrest, they just got word when the job was done. Their flights were delayed on that summer's evening in July of 2017. So to pass time, they sat down together to figure out what their next case should be with the help of a blockchain tracing the software next one. by the name of Chainalysis. The software was responsible for aiding in many darknet related cases. A darknet gambling site was one lead they wanted to follow, but that would have been a tiny headline hidden within a thousand news articles. They needed something bigger. Darknet drug markets practically ceased to exist for months after the takedown of the Alpha Bay. How were they going to match something of that magnitude? Welcome to video. I've been with the guys down at the National Crime Agency in London. They showed me a couple of their open cases. I think you might want to take a look into this one. They recently arrested a guy. I think his name was... Mm, Matthew something. Anyway, he'd been caught up posting some extreme child exploitation material on the dark net. 
They managed to gain access to his computer and came across a website called Welcome to Video. According to the National Crime Agency, it's the biggest child exploitation website that they've ever came across, home to 1.3 million users. Now before you go asking me what this would have to do with the IRS, would you believe that users are using Bitcoin to pay for the material? We ran a Bitcoin address that was a part of Welcome to Video's financial network through Chainalysis, and there it was right in front of us. The addresses of customers who are paying to gain access to the material on the site. Honestly, I can't believe that so many people, not just buyers but also the site's administrator, have done nothing to obscure their crypto trail. Some users have literally purchased Bitcoin from an exchange and sent it straight to Welcome to Video. We've struck gold here. Look, why don't the IRS take the case on? It will make headlines around the world and the trail is there to follow. Chainalysis has taken the first step. The crypto from the site is being cashed out in South Korea. So I'd start there if you're going to take the case on. With the groundbreaking case now in their hands, okay. both Chris and Tigran pulled a team together to investigate Welcome to Video alongside law enforcement agencies from around the world. The IRS were going to treat this as a financial investigation rather than a child exploitation one. Even though that was the case, they would still have to force themselves to watch the material on the site in order to come to terms with what they were dealing with. Past the greeting page, the site displayed a vast, seemingly endless collection of video titles and thumbnails, arrayed in squares of four stills per video, apparently chosen automatically from the file's frames. Those small images were a catalogue of horrors. I'm not gonna lie, this is like four videos in one. That's why it's so long. Teen after scene of children being sexually abused and raped. <laughs> Below the search field, it listed popular keywords users had entered. The most popular was an abbreviation for one-year-old. The second most popular was an abbreviation for two-year-old. Welcome to Video was home to 250,000 <sighs> news videos. The site was based on a point system. The points were used in order to gain access to the content. Look at the, what the, f bro. You could obtain points by either buying them with Bitcoin or by uploading content. The more downloads your video would get, the more points you'd receive. Oh, man. The website was encouraging the active abuse of children. It was time for the team to really get their heads down and capture as many people connected with the site as they could, hopefully saving children in the process. During the investigation, the team noticed that there was no option for users, including moderators, to pull crypto out, which meant all of the money flowing out of the site via crypto exchanges in South Korea, more than $300,000 worth of Bitcoin at that point, would almost certainly belong to the site's owner. So Tigran reached out to South Korean crypto exchanges Bitthumb and CoinOne, whilst Chris reached out to an unidentified US crypto exchange to see who exactly was running Welcome to Video. All thanks to Chainalysis. However, oh, whoa. is this Chris? He got two different eye colors? It's crazy. It was a slight hurdle. Exchanges couldn't just give users information out, and so the team had to get court orders. In the background then, they continued to investigate the site itself, looking for any more clues. You're not going to believe what happened. As a basic security check, Tigran right-clicked on Welcome to Video's homepage and chose View Page Source. After doing so, he spotted an IP address and did some checks on it. To his surprise, it hadn't been obscured by Tor's anonymizing network, which meant he was staring at the unprotected address of Welcome to Video's server. Oh, that wow. server location? South Korea. So the team were confident that's where the owner of Welcome to Video was located. They had a lick, they had an easy little case, man. They walked right up on him. And when the crypto exchanges finally got back to them, that lead was solidified. The profile packages that were sent over contained the details of two men with their pictures attached. Were the two men co-owners of Welcome to Video? The team didn't think so. One of the men was middle-aged and had noticeably dirty hands. He looked more like a farm worker than someone running a site on the dark web. Then there was the other person, a 21-year-old man by the name of Song Jong Woo. This, ladies and gentlemen, was Welcome to Video's owner. The two men were father and son. It was clear to the team that Song Jong Woo had used his father in order to set up crypto accounts that would eventually be connected with Welcome to Video. Even though they finally had their man after weeks of investigating, the IRS. That's crazy, man. Not only are you doing something this crazy, you also involved your father in it? Unbeknownst to him, is.
Like, you don't care about nothing. ...didn't authorize an immediate arrest with their Korean counterparts because they wanted to try and trace as many users of the site without raising an alarm. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jesse Liu. I'm the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia. Thank you all for being here for this very important announcement of significant actions to protect children from sexual exploitation. I'm joined today by key partners in the federal government's fight against those who exploit the most vulnerable among us. Let me be absolutely clear. What we are here to discuss today, the sexual exploitation of children, is one of the worst forms of evil imaginable. Indeed, these crimes are so heinous, they are difficult even to speak about. But our government has no higher priority than the safety of our children. For that reason, I am pleased to announce the takedown of one of the world's largest child sexual exploitation marketplaces on the dark net. Welcome to video. The seizure of its enormous cache of child pornography and the unsealing of the U.S. indictment against its administrator, Zhang Wu San. Welcome to Video was a Tor network-based... And finally, this case is really about three things. First, it's about following the money. This has been our mantra for the last hundred years, and whether the funds are fiat or virtual, IRSCI's expertise in, is in tracing money all around the world. Second, it's about protecting our children. Child pornographers prey on the youngest, and the most vulnerable in our society. Children who are incapable of consenting to these disgusting acts. These are the bottom feeders of the criminal world. There are no lengths to which we will not go to protect our children from these wretched individuals. And finally, this case is about sending a message to criminals around the world. Not a symbolic message, but a real message. You used to hide by laundering your money through shell companies around the country, but we traced you. You took your money offshore and hid around the world, but we found you. You went on the dark web thinking that your actions were anonymous, but they weren't, and we found you again. You now deal in cryptocurrency, again thinking this will make you anonymous, but our agents have once again proved that there is nowhere that you can hide. We will not stop in our pursuit. It would have been a hard speech if he didn't have to read it and he memorized it. He was 337 people, the majority Korean, were arrested as the result of a joint operation carried out by the IRS, Homeland Security, the National Crime Agency, the German Federal Police, and the Korean National Police. It's difficult to find in-depth reporting about the arrests other than a handful of cases. One user who had been a top priority for law enforcement was a man who had been posting fresh videos of himself repeatedly raping a female child. And although this user was able to access content on Welcome to Video without buying Bitcoin, as he had been racking up points from downloads, he still went ahead and did so anyway. Those Bitcoin transactions were traced through chain analysis, and ultimately, he was identified. US Homeland Security going to jail forever out. Paul Casey Whipple. It was one of their own. A deep dive into Paul's social media accounts led law enforcement to a GoFundMe page where he was campaigning to raise money to legally adopt his stepdaughter. The GoFundMe contained an image of Paul's stepdaughter wearing a specific red flannel shirt tied around her waist. With this information now in hand, the team went back to see if Paul's stepdaughter was the girl in the videos on Welcome to Video. And there it was, that same red flannel shirt that was in the image on the GoFundMe. When he was eventually tracked down by detectives, Paul initially denied the allegations, but later confessed to them. Although he confessed, as of 2023, reports state that he's still awaiting trial. It wasn't just one home what happens when you know the system. who was arrested as a part of this investigation, though. Rather, two. Homeland Security agent Richard Nikolai Gratkowski, who was assigned to a squad within I. You know what's crazy, man? They was probably impeding the results of the investigation, knowing that, oh man, they looking into it. Let me let me try to do what I can to slow them. You know? To investigate gangs in San Antonio was found to be an avid user on Welcome to Video. In-depth details about his involvement with the site are scarce, other than he was thought to have used Bitcoin to obtain an undisclosed amount of material from the site. 
He was eventually tracked down thanks to chain analysis and would go on to plead guilty to one count of receipt of child pornography and one count of access with intent to view child pornography. He was jailed for five and a half years in May of 2019. All Department of Homeland Security out. employees are held to the highest standards of behavior and ethics. While ICE does not comment on personal matters, the agency is fully cooperating with the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General regarding this issue. Over in the United Kingdom, a then 26-year-old man, Kyle Fox, had been arrested by the National Crime Agency after he was identified as a producer on Welcome to Video. When officers arrested him at his home, he was found to be in possession of 13,000 images and videos of young children, including toddlers, being raped and sexually abused. Kyle was one of the NCA's top priorities as he was posting videos of himself actively raping a five-year-old boy and sexually abusing a three-year-old girl. The young children appeared to be under the influence of drugs in the videos. When officers entered Kyle's home to apprehend him, the five-year-old boy who was being abused in the videos was found naked in his bed. It isn't clear what relationship Kyle had with the children, but what is known is that the children weren't related to each other. Kyle Fox was handed a 22-year prison sentence as the result of the Welcome to Video investigation. Yeah, they caught you red-handed too, buddy. You're going to jail. He's to spend a further two years on license when he's released. You sexually abused two very young and vulnerable children. Your offenses were detected when a video of the abuse was uploaded to a file-sharing website. It came to the attention of officers who were able to trace you from the data. These are extremely serious and depraved offenses. No right-minded person could be other than horrified by this appalling series of offenses. In March of 2018, Son Jong-woo would finally be apprehended by South Korean police oh for owning the largest child pornography site on the dark net. For the allegations, he faced a 10-year prison sentence but the judge would go on to sentence him to just two years in prison what? with three years probation however oh my god korea but that prison sentence was suspended meaning he'd spend no time in jail oh hey oh my god i got what why i don't even know the words to put together to talk about that one how who's his lawyer the harm to society is great but the accused is young and has no criminal history. He oh, repents. God. In September of 2018, Son was released after receiving- Well, you don't think he gonna go back and do the same thing somehow, some way? In that suspended sentence, but- He basically got away with it. The legal battle wasn't over. Okay. You see, an appeal was lodged by the prosecution due to the lenient sentence handed down. They felt it was a smack in the face to all of the victims. Right. Considering the things I knew well, I thought the sentence of the first trial was too light and unfair. The second judge handed him an 18-month prison sentence. Son walked free from jail in July of 2020. Did 18 months, man. It's that this this that BS. I know people still in jail for weed charges in Chicago, and weed is legal. This they've been in jail for four, four, five years. And he got out in two for this? What's going on? They ain't got the nerves to be out here still respectfully bowing. It's crazy. In October of 2019, it was announced. I swear the judicial the judicial system everywhere be wild. They just don't. They don't even. Eighteen months. That son was indicted by a United States. October of 20. 
In October of 2019, it was announced that Sun was indicted by a United States federal grand jury in the District of Columbia for the operation of Welcome to Video. He was looking at Talk decades to in jail, if yeah. extradited and found guilty. However, after a lengthy court battle, the Seoul High Court announced it rejected the extradition request on the grounds that having Son in Korea would be more helpful for the country's fight against child pornography. The decision to reject the extradition request was met with backlash. Many members of the public protested outside of the court. Ultimately though, Son would walk away a free man. Well, temporarily anyway, because in June of 2022, he was handed a two-year prison sentence for laundering the money he made from Welcome to Video. Yes, he received a longer prison sentence for money laundering than he did for owning Welcome to Video. I tell you, man, the judicial system is cr- I oh. And so, there you have it the takedown of a darknet paedophile ring. When I initially looked into this case, believe it or not, it started with Matthew Folder. I was interested in seeing- Yeah, I had. I told you I had just done a video. It wasn't, it wasn't Matthew Folder. I had just done a video and then this came out like weeks later, but yeah, I don't want to hear this. Hey, salute to you though, man. TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post. This is disgusting.